Vamos a continuar con la primera mesa de ponentes, en la cual van a intervenir Tiberios Ignat y Jesús Marco, vicepresidente de Ciencia y Tecnología del CSIC. Uh, os voy a presentar brevemente a Tiberius. Es director de Scientific Knowledge Services, una compañía especializada en ayudar a bibliotecas a adoptar nuevas tecnologías y formas de trabajo. Desde hace cuatro años dirige en colaboración con uh, University College London Press y Liber Europe una exitosa serie de talleres que se llaman Focus on Open Science. Ha sido miembro individual de LIBER durante mucho tiempo y se convirtió en LIBER Associate Member a través de su empresa, siendo actualmente el vicepresidente del Grupo de Trabajo de Ciencia Ciudadana, en LIBER, y miembro del Grupo de Métricas Innovativas. Además, es miembro de la European Citizen Science Association, y miembro del Scientific Committee para OI11 del CERN. Ignatius Tiberius, sorry, I mix your. Yeah, I know, in, in, sorry, in, 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 in <laughs> yeah. uh, Tiene un interés especial, muy personal en el tema de la ciencia abierta y especialmente en el tema de la ciencia ciudadana y la gestión que supone este cambio cultural. Posee uh, un doctorado en Biblioteconomía y Ciencias de la Información por la Universidad de Bucarest. Y yo le quiero agradecer uh, muy sinceramente que haya aceptado el reto de venir a contarnos uh, de una forma simple y sencilla en qué consiste esto de la ciencia abierta y a qué nos referimos cuando hablamos de ciencia abierta. Gracias. Is this fine? Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. Thank you. Gracias. I don't speak Spanish, but I understand some <laughs> because I, I have a Latin origin. I'm coming from Romania. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everybody, for being here. Thank you, the or, or, organizing committee, for inviting me and also Vanessa Proudman from Spark Europe for proposing me for this talk. What do we mean when we speak about open science? I was asked to, to speak about uh, on this topic. I have a short and bold question, uh, answer, sorry, not question about that. We mean a big sea change in research, a big change in research. I will support this answer with six perspectives and one set of conclusions delivered through around 25 minutes, and I try to leave five minutes for your questions, so please feel invited to address your questions. This is the agenda for today. We'll talk about the context, definition, some examples of open science across sectors, the matter of sustainability, which is very important, and I will try to introduce two fresh perspectives, the gestalt of open science and the hazards of open science, and then we'll look into the deep roots to create this transformation. Then we'll reserve some time for conclusions. First, to start the context and definitions. Meet Professor Stephen Mann from Toronto. He was the first to coin the term open science back in 1998. He is, among others, being recognized as the father of wearable computers, like this, and wearable augmented realities like Google Lens that you have. And he said, science is a human endeavor in which we attempt to go wherever the truth may lead us in the pursuit of new discoveries. And he gave this introduction in a paper about surveillance, surveillance, and metaveillance, including data veillance, he said. And he said that if the normal surveillance that is run through the normal research process is not going to deliver openness, then we need to invent something else. And he came with open science. Are you familiar, maybe some of you are familiar already with the reproducibility crisis? A na Nature published a study in 2016, scrutinizing over 1,500 researchers. 
And 70% of these researchers said that they have tried and failed to reproduce experiments from other colleagues. And over 50% of them said they failed to reproduce their own research. This is the reproducibility crisis that we are still living today. What is the cause of this crisis? The first two arguments, over 60% of responders said, there are two main reasons. One is the pressure to publish. Second is the selective reporting, selecting data sets that is corresponding with your wishful thinking conclusion. And there are two others, if we look into more detail, there are two others, other factors that are actually supporting the first two ones. is the lack of availability for raw data and the insufficient peer review. I shared the opinion with some academics that say that these factors are actually intensified by common forces, competition for grants and positions, and also the high level of bureaucracy that takes time away from researchers to do their main job of researching. Open science definition. So remember, that is the main context of open science, I would say, the reproducibility crisis. Open science definition, we don't have one. We don't feel, never run out of many definitions, in, in, in fact. We have spinning wheels saying what elements are in this definition. We have the open science uh, policy platform for European Commission. We have different mushrooms. We have a foster taxonomy. They are not all the same, but we should actually celebrate this diversity. We should not look and should not be bothered of not having one universally accepted definition for open science. Since we don't have a definition for science, if you want to stop science, ask academics to agree in one single definition of science. So we, we should not bother, we should celebrate this diversity. Let's examine now how public research is doing in this new landscape of open science. How are we doing in Europe? Here is the European top-down approach. In 2014, the European Commission ordered a public consultations for reforming science. Right in the introduction, they said, the impact of these trends, digital technologies, an increased demand from society to come with solution to the biggest problem, globalization of research. So these trends are already visible and, it, and they address some of the most burning issues of science, such as slowness of publication, the increasing criticism of peer review system, and the challenge of reproducing research results. We are still seeing these issues burning as I speak. Open science long existed before that 2014 moment. However, I find relevant to bring you the chronology of Open Science Policy Platform, a European Commission high expert level group that is informing the Commission. They started in 2014 with a public consultation that I presented before. In 2015, the Competitiveness Council welcomed the idea of an open science agenda. Before that, it was called Science 2.0. In 2016, a year after they launched the Open Science Policy Platform, which is still today chaired by um, Eva Mendez from Mad Madrid. And in 2016, they released, a so, uh, in 2018, sorry, an integrated advice for Open Science Policy Platform. We will see it in a bit more details. They received a second mandate in 2018 for 2018 and 2020. Now here it comes my favorite definition for open science. Open science, in OSPP view, is scholarly research that is collaborative, transparent, and reproducible, and whose outputs are publicly available. And ladies and gentlemen, I stop here because I don't like the rest. It seems that European Union is embarking in this open science idea for making a journey to win competition against the rest of the world. But that's something else that we'll see in a deep root of open science. What OSPP did, they released in 2018 that set of recommendations and they called eight big ambitions for open science. They put this uh, list of stakeholders and please look carefully if you find yourself in, in, in one of these categories and they gave recommendations for each of these stakeholders to follow these eight big ambitions. Let, let me zoom in, look into more details. There are eight pillars, 
eight ambitions of European Commission, set for a cultural, and not only cultural, but also structural change, a change, a sea change to open science. Each of these ambitions could be also seen as strategic directions for your institutions, for your funders, for your community. So open science says, uh, policy platform says, click that button over there, open science, and they say that not only to European communities, but also to the, to the whole world, and they say, join us, because Europe is in a way leading this movement, and discover a new world of research. Open all these strategic directions. But open science in Europe is not only this top-down approach, it's also a bottom-up approach. And here is the example of UCL Press, the UK's first fully open access press. They published since 2015, and they reached until now 2.5 million downloads for books and journals. Compare that with um, the, the classical dissemination of monographs, for example, where you have for most successful titles 300 selling copies. There are other examples that I could continue on, in the, on the European landscape. This is, for example, the TU Delft Data Stewards Championship Program. We have here the open knowledge maps that is redesigning completely the way we discover knowledge. We have GoFair Initiative. We have the di Directory of Open Access Journals that you should already know, all of you. We have, I gave this example from Hungary, ACE Consortium, which has negotiated with publishers contracts in ways in which over 80% of their open access needs are covered through these contracts in the, at, as we speak. And this is why I gave them an ex example. Or UK reproducibility, reproducibility Network, which is trying to tackle the hard nut of reproducibility. Let us see how our colleagues over the Atlantic are doing. First of all, they don't have a centralized approach. There is no federal policy top down for open science. But they have something else. They have, for example, Center for Open Science. For them, the definition of open science is very short. Show your work, share your work, advance science. And I appreciate very much what they are doing. They think their goals and vision for open science is achievable because they think openness, integrity, and reproducibility are shared values among researchers. They think that the technologies exist, the digital technologies for opening up science, and they also think we have sustainable business models. Open science framework that they develop is a collection of tools that is addressing each of these uh, scientific stages in this, in this spinning wheel. But there is something more in US, not only this center. They also have some localized approaches. For example, SciStarter and uh, Arizona State University, they are accelerating citizen science through a very important guide that they published for libraries. There is also um, University of California, which is taking lead in negotiating with publishers and inspire other US universities how to do it. And there is also University of Harvard, Harvard through their o Office of Scholarly Communication, which is reshaping the uh, scholarly, um, scholarly uh, licenses, the agreements between authors and publishers. These are just a few examples. There are many more in, in US. I think it's very important to give a particular attention to Canada. They have this Neuro Center, which is the Montreal Neurological Institute and Hospital. In 1938, as early as that, Dr. Wilder Penfield had the unique vision to advance medicine through patient-driven science. Still today, they are, doing, they are leading on an open science agenda, and if you really want to see how an entire institution and a hospital is acting completely on an open science agenda, I suggest you go to this link, turn the notification off on your computer, have something to drink for the next two hours, and study, because it's a lot that they are doing now in practice. How is open science in public, private, or in private organizations? We don't have much time, but I will give you one example. I have many other examples. If you want to engage with me in the coffee break, I can give you some other examples. Let's have a look at the Structural Genomic Consortium, which is a public-private partnership that was created in collaboration with academics, funders, and private in institutions. There are at least minimum nine big pharmas that are working there. 
They are using open science methodologies and only open science methodologies. What are they doing? Their, their methods enable consistent data and accelerate reliable discoveries. They are working together to identify, for example, target molecules, a collaborative work instead of a competitive work. Why are they doing this collaborative work in this consortium? Because they make all the data available for everybody and they think this is the only way to accelerate the discovery of new, new, uh, new medicine. For academics, this means new robust research. For pharma companies, they benefit because they get the chance to take these new molecules that they would invest a lot to discover by their own self alone and the chance to, get, to have new medicines, of course, new markets. And for clinicians and patients, they are motivated to collaborate in this environment because they have hopes for new medicine. This is just one example. Open science is not only for public institutions, it's for all our society. What is the gestalt and the hazards of open science? Back in Europe in 2014, the background document Science 2.0, later on open science. The paper has another important statement which deserves a close attention. And I quote, Science 2.0 is a holistic approach, therefore, is much more than only one of its features, open access, they give an example, and represents a paradigm shift in the modus operandi of research and science impacting the entire scientific process. Let's have a look at this gestalt. Let's pay a close attention to all of these eight pillars. Are they explicitly referring to open? Are they including open somewhere there? No. For publishing, the ambition is, for, for example, formulated future of scholarly communication. Research data? Is open research data? No, it's fair data. Why? I don't know exactly what was in, in OSPP platform when, when they formulated, but for me it's clear that the definition is looking to open science as a gestalt, a gestalt as a whole, and not to the performance of each individual elements of it, and looking to the fully open science performance of these elements. I have an example here. As an early element of open science, scholarly communication gave to the world many years in the past open access, at least 2002 when we think to the Budapest Declaration. Let's take a closer look to the future of scholarly communication as it looks in 2020. We are almost there. This image shows a metaphor. Apparently, it shows an open show a show performed by, by some actors for a, a public openly available. Is it fully open access, open access to, to this show? Look at that guy over, uh, next to the pillar. He doesn't seem to have the same access to the show like everybody else. And also the guys in the first row have a better access than the guys in the, the back rows. So this is just a metaphor, but it's important to have in mind this metaphor when thinking to what discussion is around open access now. You should know that policymakers are now informally discussing about restricting availability to view open access journals in nations that have not responded fully to, with policies to remove paywalls. It is so-called um, location-specific open access. It's not official, it's informal talk, but it's just because it exists is very important. So the gestalt of open science means achieving open science even when not all elements are fully, completely open science. Let me give you another example. The commission have, uh, was running a flexible pilot under Horizon 2020 called Open Research Data Pilot, the pilot. Participating in the pilot means not necessarily opening up your research data, rather the pilot follows the principle as open as possible, as close as necessary. And focuses in encouraging the participants to create sound data management plans as essential part of their open science practices. Again, the gestalt of open science means achieving open science even when not all of its elements are completely fully open science. Open science 
should be represented by the whole of these elements, not necessary on each of these individual elements. And this is the Gestalt. What the Gestalt means, an organized whole which is perceived of more than the sum of its parts. The, gest the Gestalt of open science that I want to introduce to you is based on the principle of grouping from psychology. And it means that open science is a new research system that is more than the sum of its part. Even if it, their part in their individuality could mean as open as possible, as close as necessary. Open science should, re should be perceived as open for the whole of these elements. Then the open science gestalt could be applied to all definitions that I presented, the variety before, and then we speak about, whether we speak about spinning wheels or, or mushrooms, we will speak about a chance for opening up science as a whole and not as individual elements. Probably you are looking now to a spaghetti of open science. There are so many things combined that is hard to tackle. Well, the same like the delicious and healthy food is hard to tackle. There are hazards in open science. Open science is not bulletproof against these hazards. This could be, in my view, first of all, the failure. If we fail now, we will not have another shot, another chance for a foreseen future. Secondly, is to become an exclusive movement for public research that continues to enlarge the gap between public research and the rest of society, the ivory tower. We should not allow that. To associate open, we ignore, especially when it comes to the resources that are needed to create open science. Open science, let me be clear, it's an expensive way of doing science. And finally, to, to build blocks of net beneficiaries that rarely move to the contributor's side. Maybe it's good to say what is not open science. Open science is not a, is not a sugar coat for open access, as I said before. And open science is also not a snake oil treatment that will cure all the diseases of open science. It only proposes a new set of methods, an evolution from the current good practices to possible a way of restricting biases in science. It's not gonna cure all problems in science. What about the sustainability? This is very important to, to tackle. This slide is probably saying everything. Being sustainable is, a act, is an act of responsibility. It's not a trend, it's not an option, it's a must to be sustainable. Keep this in mind, sustainability means responsibility. When we talk about sustainability, we should talk about two main things, two fundamental questions. The first one is what kind of return of investment should funders and institutions expect if they turn to open science? For me, the answer is this one. A quality, healthy open science system, a reproducible science, faster, reliable discoveries, meaningful translational science to the society, wider dissemination, international collaboration, better education through practice, collective intelligence, and man-machine collaborations. This is, in my opinion, what we should expect as a return for opening up science. The other question is the sustainability of open science tools. It's an act of responsibility, I remind you. One model, for example, is the general idea of a community-led effort, which is reflected here in my example, SCOS, and invest in open infrastructure that, again, I can discuss in more detail with you later on. Another example is around membership models, where members, community is invited to pay some membership to these models. This is the case of Archive, uh, that you know very well, Open Knowledge Maps, DOAJ, and others. And the third model is rather suggesting to use the resources that exist already and to convert them. This is what uh, OA2020 is promoting. This, this is what UCL is doing, eLife, and others like this, Gate Foundation with their uh, platform. This is the sustainability that should be achieved. We are not yet there in you know, open science for these tools. Open science equals responsibility. Sustainability, sorry, equals responsibility. If open science is a promise for a better research, then sustainability should be part of that promise. As opposite, as contrary. If we build an unsustainable infrastructure or one which is not able to deliver service level agreements, this is an act of irresponsibility. This is typical for groups and communities that don't take accountability for their own action. 
We should not turn into that. What is the deep root of open science transformation? Some say it's metrics. And this is, uh, it's well known that uh, academic institutions are trying to reform the, the, the metrics that they use to evaluate their work, the impact in society, and, and uh, also promotion. And this is a metrics of metrics, which is proposed, proposed by uh, Director Emeritus of uh, University of Liège, Professor Bernard Rentier. And if you like his idea, we don't have time to go in detail for all of these metrics. I invite you to read his book, Open Science, the Challenge of Transparency, published this year in March uh, at the Academy Royale de Belgique. What looks strange to me, for example, in our effort to reform these metrics, why don't we bridge the academic metrics with other societal metrics? For example, the SDG metrics, they have over two, not over, precisely 232 metrics to measure the performance on these open science, uh, these um, uh, su uh, sustainable goals. Why don't we bridge the, the science metrics to help assessing the performance on this? Because science is part of the instruments to achieve these sustainable goals. This is for me very strange. But are the metrics indeed the deep root of open science? Maybe less visible, but essential, there are other things, like the moisture in the world, uh, soil, for example. Perhaps an anonymous writer, academic writer, could shed some light into the dark. This is one of the two articles published in The Guardian last year. This article could serve as an example what is happening if we set just one set of principles to nurture discoveries? The mighty set of principles of competition. This exclusive set of principles apparently guides the current research methods and builds a strange behavior to researchers. They need to be the first, they want to be the first, and the need to keep secret their work. We don't have time to examine this article, but I highly recommend you to read it. And the second one is coming from a famous entrepreneur, Margaret Hefferman. She published also with Guardian. And in her view, the injection of competition into higher education has been very dangerous. She says, students compete for places and grades, academics compete for jobs, publication space, uh, fun, uh, spaces and funding. Everyone is being ranked everywhere. And rank is, rankings are particularly passionate in Hefferman's eye. Leaders determined to improve in rankings absorb an external set of values rather than creating their own definition of success. Indeed, when you compete, you measure your success by someone else's definition of it, not your definition of it. And when you collaborate, you have a chance to achieve meaningful, transformative results. The game changer in open science is a set of metrics that rewards collaboration, not only for measuring, but also to see the connectors that could be created between your work and others' work. Nothing from what I say is against competition. Competition is good, but in the context of collaboration. A set of conclusions. First, we need an open system that builds research communities instead of research machines. A second conclusion, without rewarding the collaboration in research, open science is less vibrant, is a disadvantage, and most importantly, it's a reversible movement. Third, the goals of open science should exceed the academic environment, and they should refer straight to the benefits of society. As the British people say, the proof of pudding is in the eating. Open science will prove its role if it helps to accelerate the discovery, the innovation, and inventions. Open science needs to support in a direct way the complex process of building high levels of technology readiness and manufacturing readiness. This is a, a tangible result of open science. And lastly, open science to increase the scientific literacy of people, to give less room or no room to fake news, for example, to people that think in an academic sound environment, although, although non-peer reviewed, that the earth is flat. Before I, I leave floor for questions, this is one thing that we are doing with UCL Press and uh, Liber, a set of uh, workshops to create advocacy. This is what we achieved so far. 
And now the, the floor is open for questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I know I spoke a, a bit too, uh, too quick, but I hope it was understandable. So thank you, Tiberius, for your talk. Now, uh, tenemos, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta a la presentación, Elena, ¿alguien le puede acercar un micrófono, por favor? Sí, está viniendo. Está viniendo. Okay, thank you. It's a very, very interesting uh, perspective for open science. My point is knowing that this is not a place where to raise this, this question because this is, an, uh, this is a session for libraries and archives and people specialize on this. But as a scientist, if we are, going, if we are dealing with the shift, I mean, in the way we perform and we deliver research, this is open science, I mean, in brief, why we mainly and only focus on open access? Because you are saying, I mean, we are saying, okay, we are, this is a change of everything, metrics. But we don't see, or at least I don't perceive, a real movement about a new different metrics for assessing research, for evaluating research, for assessing positions and researchers. But still, we keep going, we keep talking about open access. I mean, this is not, uh, how shall I say, this is not only uh, criticism, but if we are looking for a change in science, and I hope so, if we focus strictly on open access, we might change the overall goal, and we might contaminate the overall goal, and we might not reach the fundamental goal or changing the way that we deliver science. Thank you very much, and I wish we have more people like you to have these questions. It's a mislead. It's open science in the, see it as a sugar code for open access, it's a mislead and it's a big problem. And indeed, if we don't come with new metrics, we will fail. Because we have funders, we, we have two different perspectives. And I hope I'm not bothering you. We have li libraries and librarians thinking that open science is a kind of a sugar coat for open access, and it has been, open science has been inventive as a reparation. And we have a different perspective, which is coming from funders, and they see open science as a way to better return, to give a better return of their investment, and to accelerate science, to open the results of science to other parts of society, and to create better translational science. And if we fail coming with metrics, for example, as long discussed and consider the root, I don't consider it the root, I seek the root, measuring collaboration, introducing collaboration at a high level of, with competition. And I give you an example. When I, I, I gave this example of uh, structural gen genomic consortia, you know what they are doing? They, you know why it's expensive to have new drugs on the market? Because people are going to the same conferences, people are doing the same laboratory uh, studies for finding the target molecules. The molecules that turn into bad things in our, our body, and then we need to find some drugs to, for example, inhibit these molecules. Now, imagine this. If we set collaboration to find the target molecules and set competition to find drugs that are inhibiting these target molecules, we save a lot of money because we do a joint work on one stage, finding the target molecules. Now, the metrics. How would we overarching insert some new metrics in this context if we introduce the example that I, I did? For example, you should, you should measure how much institutions are collaborating to find these new target molecules. One very naive, but I would say basic practical idea is to number, to count the punch hours, how much a lab stayed into the collaborative stage of finding new molecules. You just count how many times they spend, but of course, time is just one resource. You should count all the other resources. They, how many resources they gave to, in that collaborative stage of research of finding new molecules. And then you have some other metrics that is measuring their performance of competing, finding new, new medicines. This is a new metrics, a new form of metrics that is, 
I, I don't see it explored at this moment. And if, you f if we fail after another two, three years of coming with new metrics, I think we will have funders, we will have some, some other stakeholders of research saying, what are you doing? You are speaking about seven, ten years about new metrics, you never come with new one. ¿Alguna pregunta más? ¿Alguien que no se pueda resistir? ¿O pasamos a la...? Cortita, muy cortita. I'll try to give a short. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, would you like to, to explain a little more up, a little bit uh, the risk of the uh, reversibility of the results of the, um, the open science? In your conclusion, you have cited the uh, open science have a risk to reverse, to, to come back, I suppose, come back, uh, become close a little more than the, the previous one. Uh, so, sorry, uh, if you can keep the mic, uh, uh, the, the risk of, no, no, to, to keep it. Uh, uh, the risk of the reversibility of the open yeah, science, yeah. I suppose, uh, to, a, to a close science. More cl ah, okay. So th this is in line with what I said. If, if open science as a movement is not delivering on the promises that is introducing, new metrics, reproducible research, wider dissemination, if we speak from, from a librarian's point of view, if open science is not delivering on that promise, then we will have people in stakeholders like funders, very important, also researchers, lab, uh, people working in the lab saying, enough with that. You just talk, you don't deliver. Enough with that. So we need to deliver on, on these promises. Not only doing advocacy, nice conferences, presenting principles, but also delivering tan, 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 tangible results. And tangible results is not necessary. Publishing everything open access. With all due respect, that's very important, but it's just one element. If we don't deliver in um, more reproducible science, for example, then it's a failure. And it's a reversible movement. Okay, thank you very much, Tiberius.